been revealed. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his, who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils within the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Good morning, everyone. It is great to be with you again. Helen is with me this morning, and it's always enjoyable driving out here and seeing the lovely green countryside. And it's always great when Steve makes me a coffee when I arrive. All of those things have happened, so I'm a fairly happy man this morning. We're going to look at four very brief passages, or well, they're not brief passages, but we're going to look at them briefly from Isaiah 40 through to Isaiah 53. And they are known as the servant song passages of the second part of Isaiah. I just want to organise myself here a little bit, get a little bit of room. As we do that, I'm going to lead us in a prayer and then let's look at this part of God's word. Our loving Father, thank you for today and thank you for each other. But above all, thank you for the Lord Jesus in whose name we can meet and to whom, whose word we can look and to whom we can offer our praise and our honour. And as we listen to your words this morning, we, we do ask that we will respond in a way that pleases and honours you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been scammed? Anyone want to put their hand up if they've been scammed? A few people have been... Are the rest of you shy? Or is this a fairly safe part of the world to live? Anyone here not been scammed? Put your, oh, there's a few people who haven't been scammed. It's a horrible experience. Helen and I have been scammed three times this year. Nothing serious, our credit card has been fraudulently used 
for reasonably small sums. Around about 30 years ago, a $22,000 credit card gambling debt was racked up on my account. That is a serious scam. And we were able to get to the bottom of it. There's nothing worse than feeling violated by someone who takes advantage of you. And that is what scammers do. Here in Isaiah chapter, chapters 40 through to 53, we're learning about a servant. And it seems that the servant, a servant heart, is a polar opposite to one who scams. What do we learn about the servant in Isaiah's, in the servant songs in Isaiah chapters 40 to 53. That's what we're going to look at this morning. One of the ways in which people get scammed is through the telephone, is that right? Have you got to the point when you receive a call on your telephone and you look at the number and if you don't recognise the number, you won't answer it? I have got to that point. I don't want to answer it and be abusive to the person on the other end because I know that there are young men and women in parts of the world working at call centres and they're being paid very little and they are seeking to do honest work. It won't be very long before they are offered better work, better conditions and better pay and they could well skip, they could well slip into the scam world. I don't want to be hard on these young men and women who are perhaps working for five American dollars a day, something like that. We're being introduced to the servant. I wonder who the servant is. When we get to the fourth servant song, which we do in Isaiah 52 and 53, it whittles down to just one person that it can possibly be. But until then, we're a little bit unsure. Is the servant the prophet himself, the prophet Isaiah? Is the servant another prophet? Remember, these words are being spoken to the people of God while they're in exile in Babylon. Is it a prophet in Babylon? Is it a prophet who has, been, who has been left behind in Judah, in Jerusalem, in the rubble that's been left behind? 10,000 of the leading citizens were taken into Babylonian exile. Many were left behind. Habakkuk was left behind. Jeremiah was left behind. There were young men who once they were in Babylon, they were chosen to be in the Babylonian court. And some of them were very faithful young men. Can you give me an example of a name who was a faithful Israelite in the Babylonian court? Daniel, thank you very much. Is the servant Daniel? Is the servant one of Daniel's friends? Uh, their Babylonian names were Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Remember them? And of course, Daniel was given a Babylonian name too. Can you remember his Babylonian name? I know Steve's going to say yes. What else is it, Steve? Belteshazzar. <laughs> are these four young men, are they the servant? Because they are godly Israelites. Who is the servant as we go through these songs? I was reading the story about Queen Elizabeth II. She used to go for holidays and uh, she had a break every now and again at Balmoral Castle. So she'd leave Buckingham Palace always with security guards. And on one occasion in her 80s, she was going for a walk in the woods near Balmoral Castle with her security guard and they went for a picnic. They often did this together. And as they were walking along, there was a couple of tourists who came the other way, uh, bushwalkers. And they had a nice chat with each other and it became obvious that 
the walkers who were American didn't know that they were talking to Queen Elizabeth. But they knew that she sometimes holidayed up in this area. So the Americans asked this couple, uh, had they met the Queen? And Queen Elizabeth, as quick as a flash, said, well, I haven't, but my, my, the man who's accompanying me today has met him many times. And so the focus was off the Queen and it was on this security guard. And so they asked the security guard, what is the Queen like? And the security guard said, well, she can be pretty cantankerous from time to time. <laughs> but underneath, she really is a lovely person. These Americans were so impressed that they gave the Queen their camera and got around behind the security guard and said, would you take my photo? Would you take our photo with the man who's met the Queen? The Queen happily obliged. And then the security guard said, look, would you like me to take a photo with you and my female companion? They said, oh, well, OK, we'll have that photo as well. And then they left each other. And as the Queen and her royal security guard walked along, she said to him, I'd love to be a fly on the wall back in America when they show those photos to their friends and family. <laughs> Who is the identity of this servant? Can we turn to song number one from Isaiah 42, 1 to 4? What we learn here in the songs is that the servant is going to bring justice to the nations. And not only that, but the servant is going to get alongside those who are vulnerable, those who can be easily taken advantage of. The servant has a pastoral heart. If we can go to the next one. Thanks. And that takes us back to Isaiah 40, where... Isaiah's prophecy breaks into the people disheartened in Babylonian exile and says that they'll be comforted. That this one will come and God will break back into history and he will feed, feed his flock like a shepherd and tend those that are with young and he will take the lambs in his arms. It is such a picture of true leadership because the leaders of Israel were meant to be faithful shepherds. And if we could just go to the next slide, look at how the servant will act. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. Scammers don't care about those they want to take advantage of. And there are people who are easy targets when they're vulnerable. But we can be sure that in the promise received by these people in exile, even though they feel like bruised reeds swaying in the wind, almost broken off, even though they feel like a wick that is almost snuffed out and they no longer have any hope, they are promised that here is a servant who will care for the weakest and the most vulnerable. Let's go to, to song two, Isaiah 49. Here we have another servant song. And this reminds us not only of the servant's pastoral heart, but the servant's preparation. And we read, if I can take you to verse two, if we can just go to the next slide. The servant says, He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. If the servant can be identified as, say, Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, or another faithful young leader who continued to provide hope for the people in exile, if that's true, then there were years of preparation. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. 
It's the way in which the servant was prepared for a task of bringing encouragement to discouraged people. I ask you as well, before Jesus started his public ministry at the age of 30, what was he doing from the age, say, when he went to playgroup or preschool or kindergarten, whatever the Jewish alternatives were to our education system? We know that by the time he was about 12 years old, he was very intelligent. He gained wisdom through what he learnt. We know that he grew in wisdom and in stature with God and with men. I want to suggest that from the age of 3 to 30, these were years that are spoken of here in Isaiah 49 verse 2. Could have been true, was true. Would have been true of Daniel, Belteshazzar, but true of the Lord Jesus himself in Nazareth from the age of, say, three through to 30. He made my my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. So that when Jesus burst on the scene in his public ministry, Jesus was able to provide encouragement. Jesus was able to speak and his words were able to penetrate into ignorance and darkness and bring enlightenment and hope. It's the mystery of Jesus who is fully God, who flung the stars into space and yet who was fully human who hungered and thirsted, who enjoyed friendship, who went to school, who learnt obedience. His schooling was not a charade. His schooling where Jesus in the fullness of his humanity was hidden and his mouth was prepared, his ministry was prepared to bring hope through the preaching of the gospel. And then we come to the third servant song in chapter 50, just turning over to one page, 50 verses 4 to 9. And we have a similar statement here, the sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue. Here is the servant's powerful word at work. If we can just turn to verse 4 there. The Sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens me my ear to listen like one being taught. There is nothing more disheartening than scammers. There is nothing more disheartening than people who take advantage of it between serious scamming and people who just manipulate us there's a whole range of behaviours where we can be taken advantage of and there is nothing worse than that we have locks on our doors we have alarms we have security systems because we live in a world which is dangerous and of course we know that in John chapter 10 Perhaps the first century version of scammers. There were thieves and robbers who came to to steal and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come. Unlike those who are out to hurt you and take advantage of you, I have come so that you might have life, that you might have security and safety, that you might have life in all its fullness. And then very briefly, we come through to the fourth servant song, the one you know so well, which can only refer to the Lord Jesus himself. Because here is the one whose death brings life. Here is the one who was punished so that we may have peace. 
Here is the one that we're told in verse 5, if we could have that slide up. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And if I can just read through some of the verbs in Isaiah 53, 52, 13 to 53, 12. He was bruised, he was crushed, he was despised, he was rejected, he was stricken, he was smitten, he was afflicted, he was punished, he was wounded. This fourth servant song can only refer to the one, to the one Lord Jesus, the one who took the full weight of the punishment that humanity deserves for its rebellion against God so that through the suffering of the servant we may receive life and life in all its fullness. I want to finish this talk by handing over to somebody else. And nobody in the room. It's on a YouTube presentation. And as we listen to this, don't miss the line where the preacher says, I wish I could describe him to you. But as we watch this YouTube together, it's by an African-American preacher called S.M. Lockridge. And you know what his Christian names were? You know what S.M. stood for? Shadrach. Meshach Lockridge. I can't understand why his mum and dad didn't go the whole nine yards and his name's not S.M.A. Lockridge. But be that as it may, I want us to see the wonder of Isaiah 53 in the promise of the servant who is the Messiah, who is the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ in the preaching of S.M. Lockridge. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. 
He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah, that's my king. That's my king.